The title of the message is Insecurity, the Bane of Our Existence. Let's say that together. Insecurity, the Bane of Our Existence. Our text is from Luke chapter 4, verses 1 to 2. Luke chapter 4, verses 1 to 2. I'll read. And Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil. And he ate nothing during those days. And when they were ended, he was hungry. Let's read it again. And Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil. And he ate nothing during those days. And when they were ended, he was hungry. Jesus is approximately 30 years old. Let's start a timeline. Chapter 4, we're looking at the year of inauguration. The year Jesus begins his his ministry. Are you with me? So, he's about to begin his work and what, what he was born to do. He's about to start his mission to fulfill his purpose. And the incident that we're going to look at briefly this morning is foundational to the success of his mission foundational to him succeeding in what God has called him to do, what God the Father has sent him to do. Now, to help us to understand the significance of this event, we need to look at what preceded it. Sometimes to really understand what you're looking at, you have to take a step back and look at what comes before it. And so I want to quickly dive into the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 3, verses 13 to 17. Matthew, chapter 3, verses 13 to 17. The baptism of Jesus. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John to be baptized by him. Now, John would have prevented him saying, I need to be baptized by you, you, and do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Well pleased means to approve, to think well of. Question I have for you before we proceed is what is the significance of Jesus' baptism? Anybody? What is the significance of Jesus' baptism? It's his inauguration and his confirmation and the filling of the Holy Spirit. It's his inauguration, his confirmation and filling of the Holy Spirit. Laura? For me, it speaks of a public declaration of here I am, this is the start, and God also is very public because he speaks as well, so it's sort of a two-way conversation between the Father and the Son, but also in the public space so everyone can see. So do you think then that, um, that uh, people around who were be- uh, being baptised or looking at the, what was occurring um, in the b- where Jesus was being baptised, that other people heard the voice of the Father? Yes, I believe so. You believe so. Okay. Anybody disagree with that? (laughs) Yes, go on, you can. I think to some it sounded like thunder, I think. To some it sounded like thunder. So they wouldn't necessarily have been able to um, discern what was being said. It it set a precedence. So it was like the beginning 
because he, he came as God in man's body to show us how to do it. And one of the things that we need to do to be filled with the Holy Spirit is to be baptized. Okay. So Jesus did it first. All right. So Jesus um, was setting a precedent. He was that, that, that's the significance of his baptism showing us, uh, us what we should do. But um, did Jesus need to be baptized? Yes. Marina. Jesus was without sin, but he wanted to identify with sinful <coughs> humanity. Okay, so Jesus was without sin, and so, but he wanted to identify with us. He wanted to go through what we would have to go through. Harley? The real reason to be baptized is like from your old life. Yeah. <coughs> I was a sinner. Don't get mm. me wrong, you know, did quite a lot you, of Were you a sinner? Yes. You, uh, did yes. you do quite a lot of things yes. wrong? I was, quite, I was really bad. Uh, wh you know, I really don't need convincing of that. Yeah. But when I was baptized, yeah. it start a new chapter. Okay. With God. All right. So, so, so baptism is when you, you are repenting of your sin. You, 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 you decide. You say, "I'm not going to sin anymore. I'm going to start a new chapter, and I'm going to give Jesus my allegiance. I'm going to follow Jesus. So no longer am I de deliberately going to choose the sin. I'm going to live for Jesus now." And uh, but as Marina said, Jesus did not have any sin to repent of, but He was showing us the way that we need to o to operate. Okay, but significance of Jesus' baptism. Yes, Tracy. Um, so on top of all of that as well. <coughs> um, the Father declared mm. um, and confirmed the authority of who Jesus was. You know, he said, this is my son, okay. whom I'm well pleased. So, so the Father is speaking and he's, and, and, and he's putting his seal on Jesus, um, you know, underlining the authority of, of Jesus as the Son of God. Anyone else? Oh. Uh, even though he was without sin, he still went through the water baptism, mm. but then the addition was the uh, bapti being baptized in the Holy Spirit, which is, like we said, it's for everybody. It was a first, but it's for everybody. Mm. Um, and that, uh, so it's like two, there's more than just the one part to mm. baptism. There's the so new life, in the then story, do you see Jesus being Spirit. baptized in the Holy Spirit there, in that account? Yes. You do? Where? How? When the Holy Spirit is according to the account, like a dove, like a dove, yeah, okay, all right, so it was a, good. Yeah. And over here, I just thought, is it is it to show that he's actually fully human and he'll need the Holy Spirit for what's coming? Okay, so the baptism shown that Jesus was fully human and he'd need the um, he'd need the Holy Spirit for what is what is coming, the significance of what is coming, and yet Jesus was also filled with the Holy Spirit from from womb, um, uh, you know, from being, um, from w from the beginning, from when he was from conception, as it as as it were. What about this? Thank you, Steve. So actually, what was happening at Jesus's baptism was that the Father was approving him. The Father said, "This is my beloved Son." Of who, with whom I am well pleased. The father was affirming his son. And I personally don't think that this was something that countless people heard. I personally think that Jesus heard his father speak. And I believe that John the Baptist heard the father speak. And I personally feel that that's as far as it went. But that's, again, my speculation. The Father here, our Heavenly Father, was affirming Jesus. He was affirming His Son. He was approving of His Son. He was letting Jesus know that He was well pleased with His Son. That His Son, Jesus Christ, had done well, and that he, his, he, him, he, his heavenly Father, was pleased and thrilled with him. Have you ever seen a son 
respond to the affirmation of his father? Have you, have you, how, what about you as a daughter or as a son when, you're, when your father said that he was pleased with you, said that he was proud of you, said that you, was, he, you were special to him? How did that make you feel? And for those of you who have not experienced that, then I'm really sorry. You should have experienced that. You should have experienced the approval of your father. You should have experienced the underlining of your father. Your father was made to approve you and underline you as he was made to represent the heart of God to you. And where that has not happened, I'm so sorry. But I say to you, the best is yet to come. The st- your story hasn't finished. And that's what's happened here. Jesus is hearing his heavenly father speak to him. And he's hearing his heavenly father say, I, you are my son. You belong to me. You belong. How often, it's so important to belong, isn't it? How many people that we see, that you work with, and in, who live by you, who, who, who wander around and uh, fighting for a sense of belonging? Who am I? Where did I come from? What am I supposed to do? Jesus, far, Heavenly Father, says to him, you're my son. You belong to me. And I am well pleased with you. Jesus was being affirmed, 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 affirmed. He said, well, how come Jesus needs to be affirmed and approved of? He was fully and perfectly God. Theanthropism, the, as the old theologians would say, theanthropism. Oh, I can say theanthropism. That refers us to a number of weeks ago, right? But you, it means that he's fully and perfectly God, yes. But he's also fully and perfectly human, And so Jesus, in his humanity, needed the affirmation and approval of his Father. Today, psychology would say that you desiring affirmation and approval is is a sign of weakness. Can I say to you, that is a lie from the pit of hell. Psychology often tries to... It can't fix things, ladies and gentlemen. It can identify things, but it really can't fix things. And sometimes psychology takes things and and actually kind of brings it down to uh, our human level so that we can cope with it. But it's feeding. We can cope with our pain and we can cope with our sorrow and we can cope with those things that we're struggling with and where we're going round and round the mountain again and again and again. But it's a lie. It doesn't enable us to overcome. It doesn't enable us to go, go around. It doesn't enable us to go through those things that haunt us. Because it's, they're not prese- it doesn't present us the truth. The truth is Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ created us. And we're his children. And I'm talking about the whole human race. And yes, we've opted out of his, fa- his family, but we, we, we can choose to opt in by putting our faith in Jesus. And when we do that, we become children of God and therefore need to know the approval of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. We need to know the affirmation their approval over our lives. That is how it is meant to be. We need to know that to whom we belong and that they, God is pleased with us. If you're hearing me, say amen. amen. And so Jesus is affirmed. That's what his baptism is about. He's affirmed and approved by his heavenly Father. That's what it's about. He had no sin to repent of. So it ain't about sin. It's about affirmation and approval from the Heavenly Father. All right. Everything 
has to be tested for it to be proven to be genuine. Everything has to be tested for it to be proven to be genuine. Here comes the test. Hey, here comes the test. Are you ready to get stuck into our text? <laughs> First thing you need to understand is this. God does not tempt anyone with evil. God does not tempt anyone with evil. Psalm 119, 68 says this. God is good and only does good. All right? The devil tempts and we succumb to his temptations when we are lured and enticed by our own desire <coughs> which gives birth to sin. When sin is fully developed, it leads to death. Are you with me? Okay. But God will use temp the temptations of the devil to test us so we know, so that we know, we know where we are at. God will use the temptations of the devil to test us so that we know where we are at. God knows where we're at, but we need to know where we're at. Because that's the only way we can move forward. Now, every test needs conditions. And the conditions of the test that Jesus is about to go into is hunger. He's hungry. The Holy Spirit has led him into the wilderness and he's been wandering around the wilderness, okay, for 40 days. And he's not eaten a crumb. So he's hungry. Do you think he'd be physically feeling strong? Do you feel that? Do you think he'd be that he'd feel like he's got energy? Do you think he'd have a headache? <laughs> do you feel? Do you think he'd feel a bit faint, Harley? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you think he'd probably feel a bit dizzy, Steve? You know that, don't you? When, you, when Claire doesn't feed you, you get a bit dizzy, don't you? Yeah, 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 she feeds you. I know she feeds you. I can see she feeds you. You, you know, you get dizzy. You, you know, Jesus would be feeling dizzy. Uh, weak, tired, weary. Maybe grumpy. Claire feels grumpy. She gets hangry, don't you, Claire? Yeah, yeah, yeah I know you do, Claire. Yeah, Claire. <laughs> grumpy. Grumpy. Oh, dear. I, I wonder whether he would have begun to hallucinate a little bit as well. Exposed to the elements. And no, nothing to, no, no food coming in to refresh him and to energize him and help him to keep um, everything balanced in his thinking. Mm. And so after 40 days, when he's hungry, tired, worn out, struggling physically. And how many of you know that when you're struggling physically, you also begin to struggle emotionally? Yeah. Eh? Gosh, man, feelings. They go funny when, they've not been when the body's not been fed with food. Oh, the feelings. Oh, paranoia. Fear. You know, just... Crazy stuff goes on. And then the test starts. That's not the test. <laughs> That's not the test. That is preparing him for the test. And then the test starts. The test is Satan appearing. Satan appearing. The prince of darkness appearing the devil appearing and don't think and i speculate now but don't think he'd become he'd be appearing with just with you know with with two horns and a little little tail wagging 
No, no, no. He knew, he knew that, he's, he's, he, that he was going to tempt the Son of God, God himself. And so he comes in his glory and his splendor. And he comes to tempt Jesus when Jesus is in a place of weakness and vulnerability. Are you hearing me? And the first thing he says, temptation, is this. Number one, if you are the Son of God, command this, this stone to become bread. If you are, let's say that together, the Son of God, command this stone to become bread. So he takes a stone and he brings it to Jesus and he says, if you are a son of God, the Son of God, speak to this stone. All you have to do is speak. You created the heavens and the earth by speaking. All you have to do is speak. You sustain the, the whole universe by the power of your word. All you have to do is speak. Speak and everything will change. Come on, you're hungry. You're tired. You're weary. You're worn out. You're feeling the cold like you don't normally feel because you've got no food coming in to get your, your internal, uh, you know, central heating working. You, you know, you're, pro you're hallucinating probably a bit. You're really struggling. You can finish this just like this. You can, all you have to say to that stone is turn into bread now and it will do. So if you are the Son of God, then do this now and make your life easier. If you are, 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 if you are. He's throwing a challenge to Jesus. He knows Jesus is weak. He knows that the Father has just affirmed Jesus at Jesus' baptism. He's just approved of Jesus in his at his baptism. He knows that this is all that Jesus needs to do to, to have is to succeed in his mission is to, to walk in the approval of his Father. He knows that. And so he knows that to undermine the mission, he has to take away Jesus' security in his Father. In other words, he has to make Jesus insecure. And so he says, if you are. He's sowing a seed of doubt. That's what he's trying to do. He's trying to sow a seed of doubt. Because Jesus is tired. He's weak. Physically. He's emotionally bit out there. And so saying, that, right, if I'm going to get him, I'm going to get him now. When he's weak. Physically. When he's emotionally stretched. And he says, if you are. If you are. Now he doesn't say, see, you're, you're the son of God. Turn this stone into bread. Because if it was just about that, about Jesus being hungry, he would have come like that. But it was more than that, you see. He needed Jesus to become insecure. He needed the, the, the affirmation of the Father to be undermined. The approval of the Father to be undermined. Because if that occurs, it means that Jesus wouldn't be able to do what he'd been called to do. In other words, he wouldn't have been able to fulfill his mission, which is to save the world. And so he comes in there and he says, if you are, say if you are, 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 if you are. If you are. But Jesus responds and says, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone. Jesus responds in a place of weakness where he's tired, where he's emotionally stretched, and the pressure's on. And he says, I'm not going to forget what my father said. My father said, I am his beloved son, and he is well pleased. So I'm not giving that up, because Father has said it. 
and I have my faith in my Father. Hello. I have my faith in what my Father has said to me. I have my faith in what my Father has said to me. I have my trust, my confidence in what my Father has said to me. And he has suddenly has the light break into his mind. And he has clarity of thinking. And he says, yeah, I could do that. I could change that stone into bread. But it is written that man shall not live by bread alone. That true life isn't caught up in food. But true life is caught up with you in, in relationship with God the Father. God is the sustainer of life. He is the fountain of life. That is the full counsel, devil. So in your face. Number two. Satan doesn't give up. He thinks, right, I'm going to change tactic now. I'm going to come at Jesus another way. Remember, the whole point is to make Jesus feel insecure. Say that with me insecure so he comes and it takes another angle and i want to read this from um from the scripture luke chapter 4 um, verses 5 to 7 uh, so the devil shows him all the kingdoms of the world and says to him i will give you give all this authority and their glory because it has been given to me and i'll give it to you if you worship me Luke chapter 4, verse 5. And the devil took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. The devil has power, ladies and gentlemen. He has power. He has lots of power. And he is a force to be reckoned with. Do not be disrespectful about to the devil. All right? Do not do that. Crazy false teachers and false preachers are disrespectful to the, to, to the devil. They dishonor things which are greater than themselves. They do not know what they're doing. Even the, the archangel Michael said to the Satan, when there was a dispute over the, the body of Moses, he says to Satan, the Lord rebuke you. He didn't say, I'm going to rebuke you. He said, the Lord rebuke you. Respect darkness. Don't disrespect it. There's power in it. And if you don't tackle it in, in faith through Jesus Christ, you can land in trouble. And the devil took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. In a moment of time. That's amazing. Suddenly he takes him somewhere and he shows him all the kingdoms in the world, their power, their splendor, in a moment of time. And he says to him, to you, I'll give all this authority and their glory. For it has been delivered to me, and I give it to whom I will. Satan says, I, you know, I remember years ago when I f first read that, I thought, what do you mean? He, you, you devil can't give the kingdoms of the world to, to, to Jesus. Jesus is the creator of everything. And then I begin to understand that the devil has the right to do that, and he could do that. The reason why he could do it, anybody quickly? I think... Um, uh Adam and Eve are under the dominion of Adam and Eve. Eve. That's it. When Adam and Eve sinned, when they disobeyed God, they handed the, the earth over to, to the enemy because they chose not to obey God anymore. And God had placed Adam and Eve as managers of the world. And when Adam and Eve messed up and said, we're not going to listen to you, God. We're going to do it our own way. Then after being tempted by the enemy, then... It was, they gave, the enemy was given the right to rule in the, on the earth. The prince of this world. And so, yes, he had the right to do that, to give it to Jesus. And, and, and he said, all you have to do is worship me and it will be yours. All you have to do is worship me and it will be yours. And what's he trying to do here? He's actually trying to, 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 to see if the lust of the flesh is in Jesus. 
That's what he's trying to see. In other words, you see, Jesus, we understand, was uh, seated in heavenly places. He left his glory behind to come down to be on the earth. He left his wealth of heaven, the riches of heaven, the honor of heaven, the glory of heaven. He leaves all of that wealth, power, splendor, and majesty to take the form of man, to become like us. Yes, he remains fully God, but he becomes fully and perfectly human as well. And he takes and he takes on the humanity, and he becomes poor instead of rich. He grew up in a poor city. He he worked as a carpenter, which wasn't a, a job which had lots of money. He knew what it was to struggle, and he saw other people around him struggle. And then, but he also saw, as he was growing up, wealthy people. And he saw the ease of the wealthy people, the ease of those who were rich. And so the enemy says to him, listen, if you will worship me, I'll give you, you, you can come out of this poverty. You, you, were, you were wealthy before you came to the earth. But now you've come to the earth. Part of your mission is to be poor. And it's not nice, is it, Jesus? It's it's not nice. It's not kind. It's not lovely. It's difficult. Listen, I have been given all of this power and glory from humanity. They've let me have rule over this world. And I can give you the glory and splendor of the kingdoms of this world. And all you have to do is worship me. Your poverty can come to an end right now. All you have to do is worship me. And Jesus turns and says to him, It is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Him only. And so so Jesus is saying to Satan, You got nothing on me here. My Father has approved of me, I am not insecure. I don't need to have loads of money to know that I'm right. I don't need to have loads of money and loads of houses to know that I'm blessed. I don't need to know, I didn't need to have cars and this and an entourage of people to know that I'm walking, that my father is pleased, that I'm blessed and everything's going well with me. I tell you what, in your face, prosperity teachers, because they will have us believe that we need to have a big car, that we need to have a big house, that we need to have lots of houses, we need to have a fancy-looking woman or a sexy-looking bloke, you know, all a load of rubbish. The favor of God, the approval of God, the, the kind, it just comes with God saying, I love you, I'm pleased with you, I'm for you, I made you, you are my son and you are my daughter. That's all we need. That is life. That is abundant life. And Jesus says, I'll worship my Father and I'll serve him alone. For in doing that, I have everything. Are you hearing me? All right. So he backs off again. And I imagine the devil, old Nick, scratching his head. That's just me speculating and having a bit of fun. And he comes back again. And he says, come with me, Jesus. And he takes Jesus to the temple. Oh, could you imagine this? The Satan takes him to the temple. All right. To the pinnacle of the temple. <laughs> Speed of thought. Jesus is there. All right. And says to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down. It is written that the angels will guard you and they'll not let your feet strike a stone. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you and on their hands they will bear you up lest you strike your foot against the stone. If you are the Son of God, jump! Go for it! Go on! You'll be all right because the Bible says that the angels will be dispatched And they will stop you from striking your foot on a stone because you are the Son of God. You are God. And the Heavenly Father is pleased with you. Go on. Go on. Throw yourself down. If you are, say if you are. 
if you are, he's coming with the doubt again. He's coming with the doubt again. You see, how often when we with doubt, it's a funny thing, isn't it? You get a doubt in your head. So I doubt, uh, Nigel Turner doesn't love me anymore. Right, there's the doubt. Okay, you know, you know, the devil whispers me that in my ear, right? And I come against it in the name of Jesus, that's a lie from the pit of hell. And I come against it, okay? And I've got the peace. Everything's fine. Everything's lovely. Everything's wonderful. I get caught up with something else. And then suddenly, Nigel Turner don't love me anymore. There it is again. There it is again. The doubt comes again. You defeat it the once, it comes again. You defeat it the second time, it comes again. You defeat it then, it's, it comes again. And suddenly you think, oh, there must be veracity to this doubt. And you begin to let it, you begin to think it over and dwell on it and let it grow. And it develops. So it stops becoming a doubt. It's a fact. It's a fact. And it moves from being a fact to the truth. And suddenly, your relationship is broken. I know it's not true, brother. <laughs> you're all right. You didn't have to say that. And everybody knows you're such a nice man anyway. <laughs> Doubt. And he comes to him again. He comes. And he says, if you are, if you are, if you are, if you are. He's trying to sow insecurity in Jesus regarding the affirmation of the Father. And so Jesus could have said, right, I'm tired, I'm worn, I'm, I'm, uh, you know, it's not going well, I'm tired of this, you know, etc. These doubts are coming into my head and, 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 my, and my heart because of the pressure of the situation. Okay, I know what I'll do. I'll know what I'll do to make things better. I'll know what to do. Right, okay. Right, okay, 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 okay. I'm going to chuck myself off. And, I'm, and, 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 and if God, and if the angels come, then that's fine. I'm all right, you know. Then, then what I heard in the beginning when God says, you are my beloved son and with, to you and I'm well pleased with you, then what happens then will affirm that and, and I'll be, everything's okay. Anybody know what I'm talking about? <laughs> How often have we done that? How often have we done it? But God has said something to us. He said something. He's made a promise. He said it. He said it. It's been confirmed. He said it. And, then, and, then, and, and, and as we go on in life and the time goes on, the months goes on, the weeks, the, day, the days, the weeks, maybe the months, the years go on. And suddenly and it's like, well, did God say? Did he really say? Did he really say? Well, I need to do something to bring to test it, to test it, to test it. I need to test the word of God, and 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 and, and if it comes true, if it's if, if if it's affirmed again, then I'll believe it, like I did in the beginning. And Jesus responds and says, "It is said, you will not put the Lord your God to the." Jesus said, I ain't going there. If that's what the Word of God says, that, 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 uh, that if I fall, the angels will be dispatched to protect me, then I that's it. I believe it. That's it. I don't care I'm hungry. I don't care I'm thirsty. I don't care you've been in my head messing with my head. I don't care if I'm hallucinating. I don't care what other people say. I don't care what, what's going on. Around the I don't care about that wolf coming near me. I don't care. I don't care. I'm not bothered. He said it, and so I will not test him. Because my father said to me, you are my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. My father said it to me. And my security is in what my father has said to me. Not my circumstances. That may change what has been said to me. Satan's temptations were designed to undermine Jesus' assurance that God the Father had given him at his baptism. Satan wanted Jesus to be insecure because when you are insecure, you do what, Marina? Sin. That's what happened with Cain. Cain and Abel. 
Both bring a sacrifice to God as part of their worship. Abel brings a sacrifice. God says, wonderful, accepts it. Cain, sacrifice. God says, you've not done it quite right, my son. It's not quite, wrong, quite right, right how you've gone about it. Cain gets upset. Cain gets annoyed. God says to him, be careful, son, because sin is crouching at the door to, and you must master it. In other words, he's saying, don't get dis disappointed. You just haven't got it right at the moment. Don't get disappointed. Don't give up. Watch yourself, watch yourself, watch yourself. But Cain didn't. He became insecure because things hadn't worked out the way he thought it should work out. Actually, it hadn't worked out how he worked out for his brother. Comparison, the thief of joy. So he, get, he becomes insecure, and out of his insecurity, he ends up killing his brother, who got it right because insecurity gave birth to jealousy. And jealousy gave birth to murder. Insecurity. And what Cain should have done, he should have said, right, okay, I haven't got it right this time, but my father loves me. <laughs> He loves me. He made me. He loves me. I'll get it right next time. Uh, Satan is seeking to undermine our assurance of God's choosing us. He's seeking to undermine our identity as children of God called by his name. That is what the spiritual warfare is all about. That's what it's all about. Bottom line. So how can we be assured of God's love and calling to be his children? How can we be assured? Romans 5 verses 1 to 5. Let's read together. Here we go. Paul writes, Therefore, since we've been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance. and endurance produces character. and character and hope does not, put, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. All right. God's love has been poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. You are here today because you believe that God loves you. You are here today because you are, have decided to follow Jesus because he loves you. You may have backslidden and walked away, and, but you're here, to, <laughs> you're back because you understand that, that God loves you. You may not be fully um, aware of how much he loves you in the sense of fully convinced, but you've heard that he loves you and, that, and, and that's why you're here. You wouldn't be here if you'd been told that God hates you, Yes? Come on, anybody would be here if, God, they, if, if they'd been told that God hates them. All right. And so the reason why you're here, you see, is because the Holy Spirit has been poured into your heart. Letting you know that you are loved by God. You say, well, I'm not convinced I'm loved by God. It doesn't matter whether you're convinced. You wouldn't be here if, if the Holy Spirit hadn't... hadn't done something in your heart and made you aware that, God's, that God loves you. And you're aware of it enough to want to explore, to see if it's real for you. That's the work of the Holy Spirit in your heart. Ephesians 1 verses 13 to 14. Let's read together. 
In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. The Holy Spirit has sealed, he sealed you. It's him. It's him that causes you to read your Bible. It's him who causes you to pray. It's him who's causing you to want to, to know more. It's, it's all him. And he is the seal. The seal. You say, well, well you say, the thing is, well, he's guaranteed of my, of, of, of my inheritance in God, that I'm a child of God, that I'm loved by God, liked by God, accepted by God. But there are people in church who shake and the people who fall over, the people who suddenly seem like they're, they're heating up and they're going to blow up. And I've, told, and I've been told that, that that's them being touched by the Holy Spirit and, you know, and so on, etc. That is one effect of the Holy Spirit. It is not the complete and entire effect of, of the Holy Spirit. There are various effects of the Holy Spirit. And the main effect of the Holy Spirit is that you are assured that you are loved. And when the doubts come, you just can't walk away. you just got to keep coming back. All right, next one. Oh. Whoever keeps his commandments abides in God and God in him. And by this we know that he abides in us by the Spirit whom he has given us. Whoever keeps his commandments abides in God and God in him. And by this we know that he abides in us by the Spirit he has given us. So if we keep in it God's commandment, if that's our desire... Yes, we'll make mistakes. Yes, we'll get them wrong. But if our desire is to keep his commandments, then we abide in God and God is in us. And we know that he abides in us because he's given us his Holy Spirit. You say, what does the Holy Spirit do? The Holy Spirit encourages you to be hungry and thirsty for God. The Holy Spirit encourages you to read the Bible. The Holy Spirit encourages you to pray. The Holy Spirit works in your life like a binner testified to. The Holy Spirit works in your life like Mina te testified to this morning. The Holy Spirit works in our lives. And when you feel like running and letting go and walking away from God, there's that nagging thing that says, no, 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 you need to stay with God. That's the voice of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit brings people into your life to talk to you about Jesus. The Holy Spirit does, brings healing and deliverance into your heart and mind. The Holy Spirit gives you a job and makes a way where there seems to be no way. The Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit never leaves you, never, forsake, never leaves you or forsakes you. And listen to this. 1 John 3, verses 16 to 20. Listen to this. Listen very carefully. John writes this. For by this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. But if anyone has the world's good and sees his brothers in need, yet closes his heart again against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and truth. By this we shall know that we are of the truth and reassure our hearts before him. For whenever our hearts condemn us, God is greater than our heart and he knows everything. Listen very carefully. There will be times when your heart will question whether you are approved by God. Whether God is for you whether he loves you. And John says, if we love one another the way that we are called to love one, not just in word, and in, but in deed and in practice, that we seek to do what God has called us to do, when our hearts condemn us, as, as our hearts will at times, because our hearts are weak and, and they get things wrong, etc., we can look to our obedience of, to God's commandments and, and, and be assured in his, in his love, and assured that we are secure in Him. Because it's by our actions where we will see the truth. 
And so when you're in a place when you're struggling and the enemy is coming to say to you, right, you, you are not approved of God you, and, and trying to encourage you to be insecure in the love of God, then, then you can look at what you've done. You can remember the person that you gave food to. You can remember the person that you gave drink to. You can remember the person that you smiled to, smiled at. The, you can remember the person who looked so, down and out and you gave a hug to. You can look at the person who had no one to help them and you, and you help them. And let the good works, the good deeds of your love reassure your heart. Because you can only do those things because the Holy Spirit empowers you to do them. Hello? There are times, you see, when your head is so messed up that you can't make sense of anything. But if you can look at how you are living, how you're obeying God's command, that it can reassure your heart. Because all good things come from God, and He only does good things. Are you with me? Am I getting through? And so finally, Jesus sends out 70 disciples. It could be... 72 will. Could be 72, all right? Depending on the manuscripts you look at, all right? Ancient manuscripts. We'll go with 72. He sends out 72 and he sends them out two by two. And he says, right, I want you to go into all the cities and the towns and the villages that I'm going to come to and, and I want you to cast out all the demons, uh, Amanda. Every demon's got to go. Everyone who's sick got to go. If they reject you, the pe village people don't hear you, they don't want you in the town, then you shake off your the dust off the feet and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near you and you've missed it this time round, okay? But, the, but go out and, and preach the good news of Jesus. Cast out demons, heal the sick, have a great time. And then they come back and they find Jesus and they're absolutely thrilled. They're so excited. They say, Jesus, we saw the demons flee. And Jesus, it's, I love that. In Jesus, it says that Jesus um, rejoiced in the Holy Spirit. What it means is that he actually skipped and jumped and and whooped and all that sort of stuff which I'm failing to do at the moment and he did all of this sort of stuff and he said I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven he said, uh, and he said but this don't rejoice in that you've seen the demons flee and you've seen all these miracles but rejoice that your names are written in heaven what am I saying to you? I'm saying this. The most important thing is that you know that God is your Father, that you are th made by Him, that you are loved by Him, that you are approved of by Him. Because if that's the case, your name is written in heaven. That's all that matters. That's all that matters. And if you will stay on that truth, that you let your confidence remain, your faith remain in your, the approval of your Heavenly Father, just like Jesus did, you will complete your race upon this earth. You will fulfill the mission that God has given you. You will overcome everything that, that the enemy throws in your way. And you will be like Jesus Christ. All because you and I have been approved of by our Heavenly Father. The world spirit wants to rob you, whether you're in ministry or not, whether you're a parent or not, whether you're single, it wants to rob you of your security in God the Father. Because if it, the world spirit can do that, then you will fall apart. You will fall apart. Your life will be destroyed because we all need approval. Now listen to this. <coughs> you can look for approval from one another. You can look for approval from your parents. They should show you the heart of God and represent the approval of God to you. But sometimes they don't. 
It's hit and miss. You need something that's not hit and miss. You need the approval of the person who made you. And then you can go through life with security. And if you are secure, then you can love. And then you can be a blessing. Then you can accomplish great things.